Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckroff, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're gonna cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. I am your host, Tracy Stuckra, and today we're here to celebrate National Disability em- Employment Awareness Month. And with the under the guise or under the title of Fueling Success at Work, How to Optimize Employee Dietary Needs. And if you've heard me speak before, one of my, I talk about food allergies and other medical conditions, religious-based practices, lifestyle preferences. And then the fifth one too is also physical disabilities. Individuals who are blind or visually impaired, people who utilize wheelchairs. And that is to me another disability or another dietary need, because we have to talk about how people get to the plate. Can they access that plate? So I'm excited to bring to you this wonderful woman here. I'm going to take that title down here. And we've got Teresa Goddard. She is the lead consultant for the sensory team and assistive technology services at the Job Accommodation Network, also known as JAN, the acronym that's behind her head on her screen there. She provides consultation on rights and responsibilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act and assists in identifying accommodation solutions. So welcome, Teresa. Hi, thanks, Tracy, for that great welcome. I'm so happy to be here and to uh, give your viewers a chance to learn more about how to request an accommodation at work. Yeah, and I think also for employers to understand what they need to do at the same time. But Tell people what Jan, the Job Accommodation Network, is and what you do and who utilizes it. So Jan was established in 1983. So we've been around since actually before the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Americans with Disabilities Act came into effect in 1990. We're a national free consulting service specializing in workplace accommodations. What we do with regard to that is provide free technical assistance on Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as 501 of the Rehabilitation Act, which protects federal employees. And we provide expert confidential guidance on how to put a job accommodation in place or how to request an accommodation if you happen to be a person with a disability who needs assistance with that. And we also partner with various organizations that support full employment of people with disabilities. We are funded by the United States Department of Labor, specifically by the Office of Disability Employment Policy, also known as ODEP. Okay. So that is what we do. And basically, people can contact us by phone, by chat, by email, and have their questions answered by someone who's really well-trained to answer those questions. All of our consultants have a master's degree or higher, and we go through extensive training on the ADA. Well, and that's, I'm glad you go through extensive training because the ADA has got to be very, there's lots of words to the Americans with Disabilities Act and, and yes. really kind of understanding that as a person with a disability, as well as a person who's employing people with disabilities. Yeah. And, you know, the statute itself is fairly brief, but mm-hmm. the, the body of law that's built up around it since 1990 is very complex. And -hmm. for example, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has written dozens of guidance documents just to to help people understand how it's to be applied within the workplace. And besides that, the Department of Justice also has numerous documents explaining how to apply it in other settings. So it's quite complex. Yes. I mean, and there's one, and not to bring up lawsuits or whatever, but the Justice Department, and I've forgot the, I think it was about 2010 with one of the universities because they, Mm -hmm. you know, students were eating on campus. They were asked to eat in the, in the meal plan and they couldn't 
when they had food allergies or celiac disease. And it was a $50,000 fine on that. So, and with changes to that. So how does the EEOC come about it, come it, come around to it? So the EEOC's guidance pertains to situations where there's what's called an employment relationship. Okay. So if someone is attending an employer-sponsored training where food is served, then their food allergy could certainly be an ADA-covered disability for which they could request accommodation. Could they also get accommodations from the event or the venue? Certainly. But that's likely to be under a different part of the ADA. But if I can use myself as an example, yeah. so one thing that my employer does for me as a person with a food allergy is normally if the event provides a meal, when I get reimbursed for my travel, when I get my per diem, the cost of that meal for the day gets deducted from my per diem because they, the university where I work doesn't want to pay extra for food that I got for free through the event. But because I often can't eat the meal that's offered, if that happens, then the university has kind of modified their reimbursement policy so that I can get my per diem for the meal that was not accessible to me. So that if I had to, to buy other food to bring to the event or eat before or after, it's okay. And it doesn't unduly affect me. Okay, so I have a friend that happened to, actually. I mean, she went to a conference and she, I have a couple of friends actually, and they went to events and they couldn't eat the food. So you're saying they could actually ask for additional funding or reimbursement. Yes. Yeah, so normally when I'm traveling, I get what's called per diem and that includes a certain amount per meal per day. Mm -hmm. And it varies depending on what part of the country you're visiting. Right. Uh, but let's say I couldn't eat a breakfast meal in San Diego because the thing that I'm allergic to was one of the main things uh, being served. In my case, it's oranges. So I don't eat cut seasonal fruit at events ever. And there are a lot of other things I avoid that are right. generally bad for my health. Normally, I would love fresh fruit. But if I cannot eat that meal because it contains my allergen, then uh, I can receive a little bit extra on the per diem to make up for the cost that I incur by having to get a meal elsewhere. Gotcha. Okay. Or bring supplies with me. So. Okay. So, and how do you then make that, how do you make that case? And do you have to, your employer needs to know in advance then before you travel? Yes. Just seem to know in advance that you have an allergy. I disclosed my allergy years ago uh, and brought in documentation from my doctor regarding it. So my, my supervisor and director all have that information. And the person who does our financial reimbursement for travel, she also knows because it's a need to know basis for her to know so that she can make that adjustment. And she handles all of the conversations with the financial people. I don't have to deal with it, which is great. Wow, that's amazing. And I mean, but then there's a woman I know who her boss is put signs up, you know, saying, hey, avoid shellfish in this area or whatever. And then they just, they kind of skirted it after a month. And it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to handle that. I mean, how do you, what does somebody do when they're doing that? Well, again, if I could use myself as an example, yeah. um, I can tell you how Jan has done it for me and it's been super helpful. So yeah. once I talked to my supervisor and director and I brought in my doctor's note, explained what I needed, and I... I felt I had to do this. It was my first time formally disclosing a disability on the job, but I had to do it because my allergy became more severe. I had to start carrying an EpiPen and I had a reaction to aerosolized orange oil. Oh, wow. Right. So when you peel an orange, the oil in the rind can become aerosolized. Someone was peeling an orange near me and that's what happened to me. Wow. Okay. And I, that's why I went from flying under the radar to be super vocal about my allergy. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> so I went in with my doctor's note and I said, listen, this is what is happening. My doctor's telling me I need to avoid even the smell of an orange. That's literally what my doctor's note said. Wow. 
Uh, and they talked with me some more. My supervisor reassured me that they would do everything in their power to make the environment safe for me. And we had a couple of more conversations. And in the end, what happened was they decided to ask people not to bring any fresh oranges or any foods containing orange peel, I'm allergic to the oil and the rind, into the workplace. And we didn't put up signs, but there was a mass email sent out. It applies only to my building. It doesn't apply to the whole university, just to the Jan office. Mm -hmm. And now whenever someone is onboarded, when they go through the Jan employee handbook, there's a statement in it asking people not to bring oranges into the workplace because there is someone with an allergy. So it doesn't say it's me. Mm -hmm. As a precaution, I also introduce myself to every new person. And I say, hey, you know when they said the thing about the orange, it's me. Please, <laughs> please don't bring an orange near me. <laughs> and we also have potlucks. And there's a best practice at our potlucks, which is to disclose the ingredients in your dish. People usually will write them on an index card and put it right in front. Sometimes we also love write that. the name of the person who brought it in case there are follow-up questions. Okay. I love that. I just posted over the weekend, you know, I went to an event and they were passing hors d'oeuvres and I'm like, can you let me know what allergens are in there? And the server's like, I don't have any idea. Yeah. And and it's just, and, and it had the name of the food, but it didn't have anything else underneath it. And my, I'm not mad at this. I'm not mad at the server. I'm, I want the, the hotels and the people who are behind the scenes to make, to understand and get the, these servers the, the skill set or the tools to do their job better. Right. Wouldn't that be helpful? Yes. Yeah. I would love it if I could ask a server what the ingredients are in a dish. Right. Or if I could simply ask, does this contain citrus? Right. Oh, Exactly. I mean, because that's what you need. You need to understand that. And as I teach, you know, I'm like, if you've got Teresa who registers for a conference and she says she's allergic to citrus, then that should be something that's 100% labeled on everything that we put out. Right? Mm -hmm. it's right. Along with the top nine. Right? So that right. you can be aware. Mm -hmm. I would love it if they did that. You know, those little ribbons that you get for your conference mm -hmm. badges too? Like, I would wear one that says, I have an allergy. <laughs> I know a lot of people wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, but right. mm -hmm. I would love it if there was something I could do to my badge that would let the servers know, hey, tell this person what's in the order. Right. Of. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. And that's a good point because some people, I mean, I was talking to you before we, we started is that I attended a, an education session last year at the Food Allergy Research and Education Conference. And there were four young professionals on the panel, five actually, and a couple of them said they, they don't want to disclose their allergy. They're hesitant to do that. And especially, and I think in that looking for a job, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to disclose that up front because they don't want to be discriminated against. But two of them were like, hey, I want to tell, I want to, you know, and their reasoning was we find out if they're inclusive, right? But how do you, how does someone, a young professional or even, you know, an older adult, you know, communicate it. I mean, you have to communicate it at some point, but when is the right time to do that? You know, that's a really personal choice. And I think it can be quite difficult to decide. If we could pull up the website to the A to Z section, I'd love yeah. to show a resource that helps people make that decision. All right, let me hit share. Oh, there we go. Okay. Is that right? That's perfect. Could you uh, go to the top where it says A to Z? Right there. Very good. Okay. And do you see where it says by topic? There should be a, a tab that says by topic. Yes. There you go. And scroll down a little bit to you can see the letter D. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Yeah. See the one that says disability disclosure? Yes. There we go. Yes. If, if someone wants to know more about how to make this decision, and it's a deeply personal decision, this is a great resource. And if you'll scroll down a little bit, you'll see there are a few other articles linked here as well. Right there or? Uh, yeah, at the very bottom. There you go. At the very bottom. Okay. Yeah. References. There we go. Yeah. So here are some EEOC documents that go into more detail. There's a general discussion above. 
the general rule of thumb is that technically you don't have to disclose uh, until you know that you're going to need an accommodation, unless there's some special circumstance like after your job offer, the employer gives everybody who gets a job offer a physical, then it might come up during your physical and there might not be a way to avoid that. But okay, uh, for most desk jobs where you don't really have that, you don't have to mention anything about your food allergy, your heart condition, if you're avoiding salt for a heart condition. You don't have to mention that you need pureed food if you have a swallowing disorder. You don't have to mention any of that until you know you're going to need an accommodation. And you might not know for sure if you're going to need something special from your employer till after you've started the job. And that's totally fine. But it's, let's say your job interview process includes a meal uh, or coffee with someone. You right. find that you have to disclose earlier on. Uh, I spoke just last month. Uh, for the first time to a woman who was allergic to coffee. Oh, wow. Even be around the smell of coffee. Mm -hmm. And she disclosed very early on because so many people bring coffee to work. But if it's not something that you're likely to be exposed to, like on the fly on a daily basis, then you might wait to disclose until you know that there is an event coming. And you want to make sure you make your disclosure well enough in advance that your employer has a chance to figure out what you need and put it in place. Mm -hmm. But if you're more comfortable waiting, you can. And if you're the kind of person who prefers to fly under the radar, eat a power bar before the event and drink water while you're there, you can do that. People might wonder why you're doing that, but right. that doesn't mean you have to say. Right. Okay, so I'm curious about that coffee one. That's very interesting. And actually referring it to, because there's a lot of coffee circuit meat, referring, using your aerosol, aerolized orange, the citrus rind, the juices. Is it when coffee is brewing? Because a lot of times that it's more when food is cooking that the protein is getting in the air. How does that work with coffee? Is that is it the brewing process or do you know? She did say that she had difficulties while coffee was brewing and that if the, the scent lingered in the air even after the brewing process and that she could have a reaction if someone were drinking hot coffee near her. Wow. And it turned out to be a huge problem because another department within her building decided to hold like a networking event on a regular basis, a reoccurring basis. And it was like coffee hour for this department. And they were holding it right in a big public area that you almost had to walk through to get to every part of the building. So, yeah, she's been teleworking while they try to figure this out. Yeah, that's got to be hard. Mm -hmm. You know, coffee is so important in our culture that you know, normally I would suggest, can you serve an alternate? Right. You know, let, let's not have the cheese danishes. Let's have something else. But I'm like, Maybe it could be tea with the Dean. I don't know. <laughs> could you get away with serving chicory or cacao or something else? Mm -hmm. But it's it's been a big conflict. Now, here's the really interesting part to me as an ADA nerd. Let's okay. say it wasn't another department. Let's say this event was being held for everyone working in the building or was being sponsored by her department then it would be even more important to include her because the EEOC says a person with a disability should have equal access to all benefits and privileges of employment, and that includes social events. So even if they were having a retirement party for someone in her office, they should not serve coffee at that if she can't be anywhere near coffee because she needs equal access. Interesting. Yeah. Or find I mean, another way to keep her safe, you know. Right, exactly. And that, okay, uh, it it opens up so many cans of worms or coffee cups, you know, on certainly thinking, in thinking about this. So, wow. As a meeting professional, they're hosting that sales conference or that internal meeting. What are things that employers can do to do that? I mean, not necessarily using the coffee as an example, but what are ways that we can provide that reasonable accommodation to all of our employees? How do we, do you have recommendations on how we ask 
so that we gather that information in advance? And then how do we deploy that? Well, one thing that an employer could do is if they knew an event were coming up and knew that they had someone with a food allergy, it's okay for an employer to approach an employee with a known disability and ask if an accommodation is needed, especially if you have a pretty good idea that an accommodation is going to be needed. The EEOC calls it a reasonable belief. So let's say, Jan, we're having a retreat. My supervisor could come to me and say, hey, Tracy, we're going to have a retreat. And oh, so exciting. We got some funding. We're going to have it catered. Is it okay if we would serve this? Would you be able to participate safely if we had this? And if she said, you know, we're going to be serving orange juice, I might say, that makes me really nervous because, you know, even though I don't usually react unless I myself drink it, there's always danger of spills. And could we have something else? You know, could you bring apple juice instead of orange juice to this event? Right. Uh, And my employer would probably do that. Or they might say, okay, we're not going to have juice. We're just going to have milk, tea, and coffee. Something along those lines. Okay. So that conversation could be very productive if it was handled in an open and sensitive way. Right. Now, which brings me to, I mean, it's kind of the coffee thing is I attended an event earlier this year and co-presenting with a woman who has the alpha gal allergy, which is the meat allergy. Oh, yeah. And was in this meat allergy. And she's a nutrition, nutritionist, dietitian, and they wanted her to be a judge of the cooking competition. And the cooking competition was sponsored by the State Beef Association. <laughs> oh, gee. And she's like, I can't, like you, she's like, I can't be near. She was in the room, but she was far enough back, mm-hmm. but she could not be a judge because they were going to be cooking the beef right in front of her. Right. You know, and she would have to be walking by. So she declined the opportunity and made sure she participated, but she was far, far enough away that the aerialization of the beef would not impact her. But, you know, thinking through those things, I know people who can't be in the room when shellfish is cooking. And so if you've got mm-hmm. an event and you're doing action stations with, you know, sauteed shrimp or sauteed, you know, making hamburgers on the grill. Oh, I was in a, at an event in Anaheim a while back. And uh, they were searing scallops on demand uh, at a buffet station. Uh, And it was amazing. But, like, if they were doing anything with an orange, I would need to be out of that room. Okay, so how do we... I have a way that I ask attendees if they have dietary. And this is how I teach it. I'm like, and I, because food allergies and celiac come underneath, fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh I, you know, when I'm asking questions, do you have, how do we help you fully participate in this event? Please let us know if you need any accommodation as it relates to hearing and seeing and mobility and then diet. So I put that underneath that. And then I list, is it a food allergy? Is it celiac? Is it other? And then with the food allergies, I list the top nine. I suggest listing the top nine and then saying other, because as you are allergic to oranges, Should we be asking at that next point, how is your allergy triggered? Is it airborne? Is it touch? Is it consumption? Can we ask that question? See, if we're not talking about Title I, then you would probably want to check with the DOJ to see exactly what you can ask. But another way to phrase it is to provide an opportunity for disclosure. So instead of saying, is your allergy airborne, you might ask, what would you need to feel safe if your allergen was served at this event? Okay. Yep. Okay. That's a great way to say that because it's not specifically asking which way. I mean, because there was one woman who communicated that she had a nut allergy, but she didn't communicate until 90 minutes before her, the event that she was an airborne nut allergy and they had ordered Nutella pies. Oh, big difference. Oh, oh. right. And preset those Nutella pies. For uh, nine hundred. Oh wow, yeah. So she ended up not being able to attend that event, but they made adjustments for the next few days. Okay, I like that. So, is there any so giving people the opportunity to disclose any additional information mm-hmm. about their need? And I might even take it a step back and say, is there something you'd like to share about what you need to feel safe? 
so that you're not demanding information but offering an opportunity. Another way to to do it is to provide a point of contact and say, um, here's who you may contact to discuss your your dietary needs. Okay. And I want them to provide that point of contact for anybody who needs some sort of accommodation, right? Absolutely. You know, lose your point of contact, but you know, hiring a culinary concierge, you know, this is the person that you need to talk to to make sure that you have access to the food and beverage that's being served. Absolutely. And, you know, that could be more welcoming for people who who keep kosher or who are ethical mm-hmm. vegans. Uh, there's so right. many reasons why a person might have a dietary need. Okay. So on that note, under the ADA, which of those dietary needs are covered or so, are protected, I should say? Yeah, sure. So for ADA purposes, any physical or mental psychological disability could be covered, but you need to have a physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits at least one major life activity. So let me break that down a little bit. An impairment's usually something with which you would be diagnosed. There are certain things that are diagnosable that are not impairments. So unfortunately, pregnancy is not considered a disability for ADA purposes. There are other laws that protect people who are pregnant, but pregnancy is considered part of the natural life cycle. So it's not an ADA-covered disability unless your pregnancy has caused something else like gestational diabetes. Okay. Okay. So usually a person with diabetes would be covered because they have substantial limitations in the functions of their endocrine system. A person with allergies could be covered because they're considered to have a substantial limitation in terms of how their immune system functions, which is kind of a funny way of thinking of it because actually your immune system is over-functioning when you have an allergy. But right that's how it works legally. A person with a heart condition can be covered if they have uh, a condition that substantially limits the functions of their circulatory system. And eating in and of itself can also be a substantially limited major life activity. So some people may have a swallowing disorder. Maybe they've had a stroke or some type of problem with a facial nerve and they can't chew or swallow as they used to, or perhaps they've never been able to. Uh, A person with cerebral palsy, for instance, uh, may have many life activities that are substantially limited and may also need um, assistance with eating, assistance at a buffet. Uh, They may need specially textured food. So it really depends. But there are lots of ways to be covered, especially since the uh, AD, so since the Amendments Act. Okay. But something like keeping kosher isn't. ADA. It's covered under um, laws that protect our religious issues. So someone can be protected from religious discrimination and receive accommodations under other laws. Okay. And what about those somebody who's ethically vegan or vegetarian or something like that? Well, you know, it, it can depend because some people are vegan for health reasons. Their health reason could be something like a heart condition. Uh, And so that would be ADA covered. But a person who is uh, not uh, eating vegan for health, who is solely an ethical vegan, uh, there's a chance that they could potentially be covered under laws that prevent religious discrimination. Some people may also be vegan because of the religion that they practice in terms of, say, Buddhism, Mm -hmm. uh, Hinduism. So people may have different restrictions depending uh, on that. There are also laws that protect people from discrimination on the basis of national origin and ethnicity. So those mm-hmm. could come into play also, but they wouldn't necessarily be ADA unless there was also a medical condition that, as we say in ADA land, rises to the level of disability. Okay. All right. I like that. Rises to the level. And I mean, and a food allergy has, I mean, it can impact multiple bodily functions. Which- Certainly. In the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act, which is 15 years old this year, it's, oh, what was I going to say about that? I mean, because so that could impact a variety of different bodily functions. And that's what I was going to say is that bodily functions was added in that Amendments Act. Is that correct? The list of major life activities used to be a lot shorter. Okay. Uh, So it used to be things like seeing, hearing, standing, walking, concentrating. But when major life activities were added to the definition 
through the Amendments Act, one thing that was added was functions of major bodily systems. Okay. So your immune system is a bodily system, likewise your gastrointestinal system. So if you're a person who has gastro symptoms with your allergy, you could also be covered on that basis. But you only have to show one impairment and one major life activity to be covered. You can throw in extras if you have them just to make a more compelling case, but you only need right. one of each to get your foot in the door. Gotcha. And so you shared a letter with your boss from your doctor. Do, does that require, does it require that and or it would probably help? It almost always helps. The Americans with Disabilities Act, as it pertains to employers, permits employers to ask for what's called reasonable medical documentation when the disability and the need for accommodation are not obvious and when the person has not already provided sufficient documentation. Okay. So, you know, let's say you brought in a note six months ago. If the note was very clear and included all the information the employer needs, they probably shouldn't ask you for a new note so soon. They would really need to know something. Or let's say a person has a very visible disability. It's obvious that they meet the definition of disability. That's not enough to tell the employer why they need a special accommodation at this event for the meal. Then they might bring in something explaining what they need with regard to food, but they wouldn't have to prove that they had a stroke or had cerebral palsy, for okay. instance. Or let's say the person had an obvious vision impairment and they need assistance at buffet events. Mm -hmm. Well, they wouldn't need to prove that they're blind if it's obvious. Right. But if the employer's not connecting those dots automatically, then they might want to bring something in explaining it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, because that you, we can't, we don't necessarily put our feet in everyone's shoes that we can possibly think of. Right. Sure. So, so understanding that and having an open mind around it is really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people prefer to be extremely independent and, and do as many things for themselves as possible. So people that we might think need assistance might actually prefer to be more independent at the event. And that's something we need to respect also. So in, in that note, I mean, kind of goes back to, you know, what we were talking at the very beginning is labeling. So how, what are some ways that you've seen organizations internally at meetings be proactive in that assistance around food and beverage events? Do you have any examples? Well, to an extent, it depends on the type of employer. So what I mean by that is uh, some settings, like federal employment settings, might actually be obligated to provide what we call personal assistance services. Uh, and that could include even having someone who uh, assists a person to eat their lunch, whether it's at an event or even on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, mm -hmm. But most non-federal workplaces are covered not by the Rehabilitation Act, but by the ADA and don't necessarily have that requirement. Okay. But they might have to consider letting someone come in to assist the person if that's what they need. So it, it can be very different depending on the setting, first of all. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to uh, create an open and welcoming environment where people are comfortable sharing their needs uh, and they have a good way to do so that the employer can be notified by employees what it is that they want and need. What is to feel included? Yeah. To feel, yeah, to feel safe and included. What is a reasonable timeline for that? You know, I think it really depends. I always say employees think two weeks is a long time, but it's not. So if you have a request related to an event, try to make it well in advance, way more than two weeks in advance if you can. While it's okay to request at any time, you have to give the employer a little bit of space to figure out how to actually implement what you're asking for and to see if it's something they can really do. Okay. Uh, they, at the event is probably too late in some cases, but you know, sometimes you just don't realize it until you get there. Right. And that goes into like meeting planners, 
thinking through, like putting their feet in in a guest shoes of walking into a venue, right? Is there how does somebody who utilizes a wheelchair, you know, get into this venue, right? Do they have to go to the back of the house around and in mm-hmm. or things like that? And it's really thinking through that and being proactive about it. So go ahead. Oh, even having enough space between tables can be very important mm-hmm. for someone using a mobility device. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I went to an event years ago and it was a, a education or was a, the conference was on inclusion. And I walked into the ballroom and there's no way that anyone who uses a you know mobility device could get through that room. I'm like, this is really, you know, just a, whatever that word is, right? <laughs> Have <Right>. tough <laughs> that you're talking about this and it's, you know, you're not providing that. A little bit of a tangent on that. Is there limits on what an employer has to do to accommodate an employee? Yes, there are. I always tell employees, you can ask for the moon, but you might not get it uh, because there are some limits. So technically, an employer gets to choose what accommodation they're going to implement. So you make your request and uh, the employer is permitted to ask in most cases for some supporting documentation. They're not required to, but they usually will because it's allowed. Uh, But if you don't have an obvious need and you haven't provided any documentation, there's a chance the employer might not have to do anything at all if you're holding up the process by not providing what you're supposed to. Also, if something is what's called an undue hardship, then an employer can take that particular accommodation off the table. They would still be expected to explore other options. So I'll give you an example. We had a case about a year ago of a restaurant worker, and the place where she worked usually did not serve shellfish, but they were having a special promotional event. So for one month, there was going to be a shellfish item on the menu something with shrimp. Mm -hmm. And she wanted her restaurant not to participate in that promotion. And, but it was like a chain, a national chain doing (laughs) this thing. And they're like, can we not do shrimp month? (laughs) Because I'm allergic. Well, that's something that most employers would not consider doing. And if something is a fundamental alteration of an employer's service, that could be an undue hardship. If something is too costly, that could be an undue hardship. There's a list of things that could be components that factor into an employer's determination of undue hardship. So at the time we received the call, this person was actually planning to go out on leave for a few weeks during the promotion. And the employer had contacted us to see, is there anything else we could do? Because, you know, she's losing money and and we feel bad about that. But we can't not serve the shrimp. Right. And were they going to pay for her leave? Typically, leave under the ADA is unpaid unless you have some accrued PTO that you can burn. Okay. So, no, they weren't planning to. And that's pretty common, unfortunately. What they were looking at was they owned multiple restaurants. So they were going to see if perhaps she could work at a different restaurant owned by the same Uh, Oh, that's a good company just during that time. Mm -hmm. That's a unique way to look at it. Yeah, I think they they actually called me to see if they would have to pay the extra uh, gas mileage for her to get to the other spot, which I thought was really generous of them to consider. Right, definitely. But I like that, which brings me to thinking of a, a guest, a company that out of Atlanta that helps individuals in the restaurant hospitality industry. Oh my gosh, my friend Wendy's gonna kill me. The name of it is escaping me at the moment. Just be, or kitchen. Oh my goodness. What is it? Kitchen Atlanta help. Oh my gosh. I have her promotion. It's killing me that I don't know it. Giving Kitchen, the Giving Kitchen. And that's actually an organization that helps people in the restaurant industry, hospitality industry, when they're having an undue hardship you know, of some point. So oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So I just put the, I just put the link in there. Um, sorry, Wendy and Amy, I just spent three days with you and I, but there it is. It, the link is in there. So if you've got a medical condition, you've got different things you can apply for support. So that's a, that's a way to look at it too. 
You know, what an amazing project. And that brings up a good point because when an employer is making an undue hardship determination, mm-hmm. if they're basing it on cost, they are actually supposed to see if they can find any external resources to help defray the cost. That's a okay. part of the process. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So that's another way for Giving Kitchen to look at it as well. So, and it, it was co- born from the fact that somebody died of cancer and oh. they raised money for their family. So that's how it was born. So it's a really good program. The one thing that made me think of the accommodation too is talking to a chef that works at a hotel, right? And this was a couple of years ago. He's like, well, I bought these extra toasters. I bought these things. Can I charge meeting planners for those extra toasters? You know, if they're at, you know, or what? And then actually gluten-free Globetrotter this week, I thought on her Instagram feed or stories, she posted little bags that you can put your gluten-free bread in as you put it into the toaster so that you're not getting cross-contamination. And I'm like, oh, oh I've seen those. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, oh, that's a, you know, that's an option that a hotel could provide, right? If they don't have the extra toasters or things like that. But what, how, you know, can a hotel charge extra for those things? If a meeting planner is asking, and I mean, that's a Justice Department question, maybe not an employment issue, but what about their employee? Let's just jump it. They feed their employees. How do you know in the, in those hotels? Mm, How does see. that work? Whenever there's an extra cost for an accommodation mm-hmm. and a potential shared responsibility, this comes up a lot with interpreters, actually. Okay. Um, we always suggest, if possible, that you work that out before the contract is signed. Okay. And so that, you know, I would like to see something in every contract that says if there's a, a cost for accommodation and it's above X amount, who's going to cover it? Because yeah. the way it works with Title I is, let's say you're partnering with someone else to provide a training. You as an employer probably have obligations under Title I of the ADA. They probably have accommodations under Title III of the ADA, which the DOJ handles. But if they drop the ball, you still have an obligation under Title I to do what you can to try to make sure that the person you're supporting to go to this event has equal access to that opportunity. Okay. So the EUC is very clear. you got to have equal access to the benefits and privileges of employment, which includes trainings and social events. All right, I'm going to put the link in here to Title I, and then I'll do Title Three. Can you, while I'm putting those links in, can you just briefly explain the difference between Title I and Title Three? Uh, sure. So the Americans with Disabilities Act has multiple titles. Title I applies when there's an employment relationship between an employer and an employee or an employee and an applicant. Sometimes volunteers and interns can even be covered under the ADA if they receive something. So for instance, a volunteer fireman who receives insurance for volunteering might be able to get accommodations under Title A or Title I of the A if, in fact, they're able to show they count as an employee. There's a document called Threshold Issues that you can use to figure out who's an employee and who's not and what type of companies are covered entities and which ones are not for Title I purposes. And that's called threshold issues. But if a place is what we call a place of public accommodation, a place that the public is free to come to, like a doctor's office, a legal office, a store, a restaurant, it's like a center. Exactly. It's likely they have obligations under Title III of the ADA, which applies to places of public accommodation. And the DOJ writes the guidance documents for titles two and three. Two applies to government settings. Okay. Like convention center is owned by the government. Is that state or city? Does it, or federal? So let me see if I can come up with an example. West Virginia University is actually a state institution. Everybody at West Virginia University is also a state university. And we do have an event center that people can rent out. Even, you know, members of the public could, like I've been to weddings there. As a place of public accommodation, 
a place like that is likely to be covered under Title III. I'm not allowed to say for sure ever in any case. But they might also be covered under Title II because they're owned by a state institution. So okay. also like, like a 4-H camp that's owned by a county okay, might be under Title II. Okay. But if not, the person's going to be able to get what they need under Title III. And any place that receives federal funds may also have obligations under other parts of the Rehab Act that don't have to do with employment. There are so many intricacies of this because I could come up with so many different scenarios to give you. And it's like, how does this fall? You know, I mean, we should do this okay. again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I like thinking of a public park, you know, that's owned by the city yeah. or, you know, in, you know, owned by the city and your employer is having a corporate picnic mm-hmm. and they've rented that park. You know, where does all that, you know? Yeah. So that's a place of public accommodation. It's government and you're doing an employee event there. Right, right. right. But it can be hard to parse out exactly who has the responsibility, the employer or the venue or the caterer. Right. So if you can handle it ahead of time in the contracts, that's the ideal. Does that always happen? No, I'd say very much not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that just requires being very proactive and thinking through things like, hey, do you charge for this? And, you know, I'd say that a toaster that cost you $50, you paid for that over and above if you had that toaster for three years. So you should not be paying, you know, but toasters break, you know, at the same time. So, wow, there's so much to talk about, Teresa. Yeah. But like a grill station might be a lot more expensive than that. So, right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So I can kind of, I can see where there could be a line where you would want to seek reimbursement. Right. If you have to buy a separate grill for this to happen, then that's, to me, a, an undue burden, you know, for that to happen. You know, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Title two and three uses the term undue burden. Title one uses okay. undue hardship. So that's absolutely correct. Okay. I use that term. So what's the difference between the bar- burden and the hardship? Well, well, they're very similar, but the guidance documents use slightly different languages. Okay. So they just word things a little bit differently, but it's essentially a very similar concept. It's just under a different part of the law. Okay. And of course, the case law is different. Right. Exactly. Removing barriers to employment. We've kind of covered that, you know, maybe describing what kind of experience that you provide in your workplace as it relates to food and beverage events. Is there anything else that we could remove barriers for employment around food and beverage? Let me think. So when we think of a barrier to employment, usually most people think of things like, oh, there's stairs and we need a ramp because this person who uses a wheelchair can't get up the stairs. They're a barrier. But your work culture can also be a barrier, particularly for people with hidden disabilities. So I think the most important thing an employer can do is uh, cultivate an environment that is welcoming, that is inclusive. That's a safe place to share your needs. And the other thing is to create a culture where uh, people build a community within their workplace. Because when you really care about your coworker, you'll make more of an effort to make sure that the potluck is friendly for everyone. I know that happened at one of my workplaces once. I had a colleague who needed to avoid several things, salt and cholesterol primarily due to uh, a heart attack. And it was very hard to get them to come to any event because they didn't want to be there and not eat and potentially cause offense. But because of the welcoming environment and the community spirit and the work, uh, people actually really wanted this person to attend and talked with them about, well, if I make this, is that something that would be okay? So after that, there were always plenty of things that my coworker could eat because people themselves cared enough to make a difference. Cultivating that spirit is crucial. And I really like that. And Lynn just popped in here and said, this is so eye-opening. Most are afraid to ask for help. Teresa needs a megaphone. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I think that's really important because you, one of the things that you said right there is that he didn't want, he or she did not want to be that burden, Mm -hmm. right? And, And it's how we cultivate that community, that experience across the board so that 
people don't feel like they're a burden. Yes, yes, exactly. And it was very important that the coworkers did this out of a sense of community because a supervisor is not allowed to say, hey, so-and-so had a heart attack. Can we all have served low-fat dishes at the potluck? No, a supervisor can't make that type of disclosure. Okay. The individual might feel safe disclosing to coworkers if you have a good, welcoming, inclusive corporate culture. And that reminds me of a gentleman who, when he had a diabetic reaction and passed out in his office mm-hmm. and people couldn't find him for two hours. They didn't know he was that actually behind. He, they thought he had gone oh. out to lunch and he was behind his office door and they mm-hmm. finally found him. But so his coworkers knew. And, and I think that's one of the other things about that inclusive environment and, and the culture of your office is like, do you have a buddy or Teresa and Tracy are buddies? So Teresa knows, hey, Tracy's allergic to this and Tracy knows Tracy's allergic to oranges. And how can I help support you in case of an emergency, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. And uh, it's funny you should mention that because my coworker Tracy once saved me from a cupcake that had orange in the icing that I didn't know. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. That's crazy. And it, yeah. could she get into it or how did she know? Uh, it was, I, I don't remember exactly, but I had come down from another floor mm-hmm. and uh, there were cupcakes. And if there are cupcakes, I'm going to look at them. <laughs> and she just came flying out of her office and she's like, oh, no, Teresa. That has citrus. (laughs) I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. That's so important. And I, and I'm glad, you know, she saved your life potentially. For for real, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. So last question, what, and I ask everybody this, but you know, succinctly or however you want to do it, fast, fast speed, safety, sustainability, and inclusion in a food or beverage experience, from your perspective, what does that mean to you? What it means to me is that the environment and the supports are such that a person can feel safe. I want people to feel safe and welcome at all events. So that to me could mean that there are good practices in place to encourage disclosure and accommodation requests and that those things are followed through on. But it also means that um, I don't feel like I have to hold back when I discuss my needs. I can discuss them freely because this is a safe, welcoming environment. I like that. Yeah. I so many stories to tell you and figure out. And but yes, let's come back and do this next, you know, next year sometime and figure out if there's other co- topics of conversation to bring up about this. But I think the education Lynn said is correct is that we need a megaphone because we just need to really educate people that dietary restrictions, food and beverage plays into a lot of people's ability to access that food. Absolutely. And can I just say, I have so much respect for the work that you do. Bringing attention to these issues in the context of event planning is absolutely critical. And I'm grateful for the work that you do. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, so how does everybody get a hold of you? I do have your website, which I'm going to put up here, or LinkedIn profile. Do you want LinkedIn or website? Just the website is fine. So the organization I work for is called JAN. Mm -hmm. ORG is our website. And we do take calls for telephone consultation. That's part of our free service. You can reach us at 1-800-526-7234. Okay. And uh, you also can go to our website and enter a question through the website or chat with a consultant during our business hours, which would be 9 to 6 Eastern time. Okay. Yeah, we'd love to awesome. talk to you. I'm going to take out that index aspect of there and add this back in there so people can see it. Th- that's great. And the chat, is it, I'm going to ask, is it a bot or is it a real person? You know, a lot of people think it's a bot, but it's a real person every time. <laughs> okay, good. That's good to know. You can find Teresa through all of those connections and other very trained individuals who work for Jan and that can help you find that. And I'm so grateful that this network or this organization is around to help people, employers as well as employees, find the support that they need. Absolutely. And I do hope anybody who has a question will contact us. It helps with our research on the costs and benefits of accommodations as well. 
So we love getting questions we've never gotten before because it's helpful to our organization as well. Well, thank you so much for t- Teresa and everybody. We were, we, this is how to optimize employer, employee dietary needs at your events in celebration of Disability Employment Awareness Month. So I appreciate you being here, Teresa, and sharing your expertise. Thanks for having me, Tracy. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.